a slightly better sound, hopefully. All right, so let's uh, the timer tick down, and we shall get going. All right, folks, so as you can see, it's a bit of a mess here. Um, I am starting with a, a completely fresh rig on my live streaming. Uh, I have not uh, done this in a little while, uh, but I'm hoping to once again go back to regular, at least weekly, live streams for uh, the foreseeable future. Uh, doing, you know, just little side projects, little bits and pieces that I... I figure might be exciting and fun to to do on uh, on this format rather than my usual commission painting or or, or speed painting. Uh, and for today, and and possibly for two to three weeks, we'll see how how quickly it goes. Um, I'm going to be experimenting with using a limited palette, and this particular limited palette is known as the Zorn palette. So. Um, a limited palette is where you are only using a handful of colors uh, and usually this is uh, designed to restrict you in some way. Uh, it can often give you a means of learning better manipulation of color, how to mix colors more effectively. Uh, kind of the most obvious limited palette I guess is the three primaries black and white. It's a five color limited palette. but it doesn't actually really restrict you all that much once you are familiar with color blending. With three pure colors, primary colors, and black and white, you should be able to achieve almost any hue that you wish. Um, in this case, with the Zorn palette, uh, the colors that we're looking at here, let me switch over to painting, are um, black and white. Now, the Zorn palette used uh, India black um, uh, along with the titanium white. We think uh, it's not 100% sure uh, what exactly was he was using, um, but these two colors are, are colors I had in my collection, so I'm, I'm using these. Titanium white is a classic. Um, this is actually how I paint uh, with white at all times, so uh, titanium white is just my white paint. Um, similarly, this is pretty much how I paint black. Um, black has such excellent coverage, I don't really feel the need for high viscosity in my black. Uh, you could use a, a heavy body acrylic like this uh, for your black if you wish. Um, this is going to be interesting because India black, I think, has a more blue hue to it. Um, which is, as you will see, and as I will talk about later, pretty essential for a Zorn palette. Um, this, I think, is a pretty pure black without, without blue notes to it, so we might struggle a little bit with this. It should be interesting. So those are the black and the white, and then there are two other colors at play, um, and these I picked up especially for this project. Pure old red. Uh, this is a substitute for vermilion, which is generally considered to be and a Zorn uh, typical red, and then yellow ochre, which, which matches what he used to use. Um, so those are the paints that I'm going to be using. I'll talk a little bit more about and a Zorn and the Zorn palette as we go along. Uh, if you've got any questions, throw them up in the chat. Uh, as we go, I will be keeping an eye on it so I can uh, speak to those things as we go for sure. Uh, here I'm just prepping my wet palette. So for those of you that have not seen any of my content before, uh, the wet palette that I use is very sophisticated. It is a Ferrero Rocher box um, with chamois leather in it. I really do not like using a sponge for my wet palette. I don't find it holds nearly as much water as I would like. Um, I find that chamois leather is, is much better as an absorptive media and gives me a much better result with my wet palette. And then on top of that, I am going to put a little bit of Reynolds parchment paper, uh, which is uh, nice and white. A lot of parchment papers that you find are, have kind of got a brown tint to them, 
which masks the colour a little more than I would like. So, palette's done. I'll just uh, apply some colours. Now, I'm going to apply these in a kind of weird manner. I'm going to start this off by kind of doing a little bit of a colour wheel, just as a demonstration. Uh, so, we're going to have... <coughs> black kind of taking the position of the traditional blue. We're going to have some red. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous red. And finally, we will add some yellow ochre. So, there we go. Now, with these colors, we can make a good run at a um, color palette. Okay, so we can take some yellow and a very small amount of black and move in this direction. You'll see this is starting to shift it slightly towards green. And then we can... Black, as you can tell, is a very, very strong color. Mixing these will give us into oranges. Blended those slightly the wrong way around. This color, this section of the color palette is also where we're going to be mixing our flesh tones which are uh, quite an important part of our painting and, and obviously something we want to get right. Wow, these paints do not taste pleasant. Okay. up a little bit already kind of desaturating pretty aggressively so when you are mixing in blacks and whites you desaturate your color you lose a lot of the vibrancy of the color and then to bring these into the the middle uh, we add in white and this is really a demonstration I'm going to be mixing my colors a little bit beyond what this palette allows for just to demonstrate you can lighten them up with your white right so Just a very rough and ready pass on what we can make from the Zorn palette. So you can see we've kind of got purples up here. We've got kind of salmon pinks coming in here. And these are going to give us some flesh tone options as we 
kind of play with them a little bit more. Pure red and white will give us that kind of hot pink. And finally we've got this kind of deeper red crimson mixed in. Okay, so this is just a very crass wet palette here that I will I'll be working away from. So Anders Zorn was a uh, very, very famous artist of the uh, late 19th century, famous for his portraiture mostly. Um, he did watercolours when he was younger, but he really made his name doing oil colours. And whilst not all of his um, painting was with this limited palette, uh, it was hugely influential on his look and his style. And, you know, obviously has become something of a, 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 a known phenomenon. Um, I really kind of got interested in messing around with this palette as part of uh, co-hosting an episode of Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan, uh, where uh, Dan had... Um, added it to a list of topics for us to discuss, and I was unaware of what it was, so I, I looked it up a little bit further and I thought, this will be this will be a fun challenge to to try my hand at. And so that's that's kind of why I uh I'm doing this. One of my favorite things when trying something out is to do it on just a few models. Not one, not uh you know a whole army, but just a small number that I can mess with and uh, try things out on and not be too worried if they don't come out but still have a few different forms to to try and and see how we go so it's one of the things that I most love about um, Warhammer Underworlds uh, is that the warbands are between like three and nine models uh, they're not many but you feel like you've completed a whole thing when you've done them and you can experiment with different techniques on a single warband and it doesn't matter if it doesn't carry across to other warbands. Um, I recently did stippling as uh, an experiment just painting uh, the Osioch Bone Reapers warband called Canaan's Reavers I think. Uh, Canaan's Reapers um, entirely using stippling. Uh, you can see photos of that on my Instagram. Uh, I've done other things. I experimented with the Scale 75 Instant Colors on uh, the Savage Orc Hedrucker's mob. Um, this time we're going to mess around with Zorn's palette on uh, Kagra's Ravagers, I think they're called. Um, so initially I'm just going to kind of slop on some colors. I have no real clear indication of what color palette I would like to use. Here I'm just laying down colors, blocking out sections, and kind of seeing where it goes. As always, uh, two thin coats are the way to go here. So that is what we shall do. Now, uh, I am not running a monitor, so this is going to be interesting. Hopefully I don't go off camera too badly. Um, you will notice that all of the paints that I'm using are regular artist paints, uh, either acrylics, uh, heavy body acrylics like the white, the the red, and the uh, ochre, or they or or uh, an artist's acrylic ink in the case of the black. Um, as I mentioned, with the white and the black, I I use those as my regular paints in any case. Uh, there is no real reason you can't use um, regular acrylics or even regular oil colors on models. Um, it is a matter of preference. Uh, model paints have definitely have their uses. They usually have um, a slightly quicker drying time I find. Uh, they definitely have a different finish because they don't... Uh, model paints will have uh, matte uh, additives to them 
to mat them down when they dry, some more than others, um, but it does affect the properties of the paint. But um, yeah, you know, otherwise they're, they're really pretty much the same, and especially if you're like me and you tend to um, prime your models when you're finished, uh, it really shouldn't make much of a difference. I'm gonna <clears throat> that section dry. I'm gonna go into a little bit of a bright colour for the loincloth here. I think for the boots as well. Let's see if I Being pretty rough and ready with this, just getting those initial base coats down. We're going to refine this more as we go. I'm running with a bunch of webcams at the moment. I do hope to get some uh, slightly more professional gear up at some point so that I don't have a webcam in my face as I'm painting. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> As ever, if you've got any questions, anything you, you'd like me to demonstrate or answer, just throw it up in the chat. I have the chat window open and keeping an eye on it. So, uh, yeah, just, just throw it up in there. If you are very observant, you'll possibly, it's kind of hard to see here, but you'll possibly notice that I am actually leaving some of the, the very most recessed areas just unpainted. Um, just because it's, it's too much hassle to try and, and get in there with the paint to uh, paint them up, so. Pure laziness, they're in the shadows anyway, so once we're finished it won't actually look out of place unless you know to look for it. Mix in a few other colours here, just for the... convey the patchiness of the material. And then I think, seeing as we've gone so heavy on the various shades of ochre for that, we can bring out some reds for the armor. Now, additionally, these models have quite a lot of what I imagine to be exposed metal, which is going to be fun. Uh, without metallics, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of NMM on, on this model to, to paint those out, um, which will be exciting. Uh, it is, in fact, generally my preference to paint MMM in this manner, so uh, it shouldn't be a much of a change from usual. I'm imagining a lot of bronze, which will be a bit, bit different for me. I don't tend to paint bronze as much as, as silvers and uh, somewhat golds, but it uh, shouldn't be too much of a challenge. Actually, gonna re angle the camera to my actual chosen painting position. I'd angled it down for the wet palette initially, uh, but we kind of explored that already. Now, one thing to be careful of with heavy body acrylics is you do need to thin them. Uh, if you don't, you're going to get streaks on your model from the texture of the brush application, so do be aware that that's a consideration as you paint.
As always, I've prepped these models with a Zenithal uh, prime. Uh, at the time I was priming these, I didn't know what I was going to use them for. I think if I'd been aware that I was just going for a, a Zorn palette exercise, I probably would have gone with a, a pure uh, white prime for them, just to give uh, as much color vibrancy as possible. Uh, but this is not going to be a problem, really. We're using paints with pretty good coverage. You may notice that this red is really not having any trouble covering uh, on a really on a single coat, uh, which is a pretty good guy for a red paint. And the same with the ochre. These heavy body acrylics do have often have pretty solid coverage. Just using a darker red the areas that I know are going to remain pretty shadowed. So mostly I've been working around this kind of outer ring of the uh, color wheel that I sketched up. That gives me plenty of inch space to introduce white for the highlights, which I will not be doing in all cases, but I will certainly be doing in uh, in some cases. So it gives me space to work. Um, I will also probably be moving more up towards the black uh, for shading in some areas, as indeed I've already started doing on some of the armor segments here. Thinning that paint a little bit more than I have done. It's going to make them look kind of corn berserkery, in which I think they're really meant to be chaos undivided, but we'll, we'll work with that. I may just come back in and introduce more black elements to, to the piece overall to move the, the impact of the red a little bit. Noticing as we go that there's a lot more cloak to work on as well on this piece. I'm gonna set this aside to dry in a minute. I 
Alright, <clears throat> have a, a few more to work with here. So, this one has what looks like dragon scales for a cloak. Um, with that claw coming out, so I'd really like to, to try and push the green there. So that's going to be a bit of a tall order uh, with the color palette we have. This black is indeed pretty pure black. Um, so gonna have to work at it a little bit. Get something like this. We're never gonna get a super saturated green, but with a little bit of work we might be able to get something workable here. Let's desaturate it pretty heavily. We're down to it's just a grey. There we go. Shift it a little bit. Should work for for the purposes of this. It's a, a slightly muddy green, but uh, there are limitations with this palette. So blue is is obviously only coming through from the black, which means you're going to desaturate very quickly with anything blue. And if you choose the wrong black, as as I have done. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to get any sense of that at all. Um, so not having a, a blue means that greens are also a challenge. You know, cyans are, and turquoises are basically out of the palette altogether. Um, purples can also be quite a challenge, although the, the, the black and the red seem to work actually reasonably well in achieving those. Uh, you also don't have super saturated yellows or oranges in this palette. Um, ochre is already quite a desaturated yellow, uh, so that, that can be a real challenge. Um, fortunately, however, the, the color choices are very well suited to flesh tones. Um, and although there's not a whole lot of flesh on these models, I do have some on Kagra herself. So we'll see that uh, in a bit. Initial layer down. same as before. For those of you that are uh, Warhammer aficionados that enjoy the game, um, you'll find that this palette has a lot of similarities to John Blanche's Blanchitsu style. Um, it's, uh, you know, kind of similar color aesthetics. And again, you know, just as, as Zorn was not always using this palette, uh, John Blanche does, does venture out a little bit with, with his palette choice uh, at times. He um, strays off into the use of other colours when the, the mood takes him, but definitely landed on a, a style for the most part that is... Uh, 
very similar to this, lacking blues, lots of uh, inky colours. I think he uses sepias more than ochres, but uh, still definite similarities, striking reds, uh, and uh, a heavy use of black as well. Uh, it's more stylistic with John Blanche, uh, and as Zorn was really achieving pretty realistic uh, uh, results with, with his palette choice. So, uh, John Blanche definitely has a style as well as the limited palette in his, in his favour. I'm going to try and avoid going too Blanche to with this. Uh, I want to really try and channel the Anderson <coughs> aesthetic uh, as much as I can. Um, we'll see how it goes. Gonna just rebuild a little bit more. I am generally not one for mixing my own colors. Uh, the reason for that is that, you know, some of you will know, I, I predominantly am looking at batch painting and, and painting large blocks of troops, doing commissions, and when you're doing that, like, m messing around, mixing a color, and then having to go back and match it at various points in the future as, as you know, your client comes back to you want, asking for uh, more uh, of to match the existing army that they have. Uh, it's a lot easier just to look up what the the original color was and have a single color rather than trying to color match to to existing models. Um, I you know I, I fully appreciate the benefits of uh, a more you know, sophisticated knowledge and uh, usage of uh, color mixing blending paints etc uh, just for the style of painting I tend to lean into it it can be more of a hindrance than a benefit having said that you know I will still even even with that said I will still mix colors as I as I go uh, to blend between highlights and shadows etc but I, th I don't really think of that as, as mixing paint so much as, as just getting those transitions in. Um, right. Talk on the shield. This gauntlet here. Still very much in the phase of just blocking in colors with these models. Um, I'm going to do almost all of the painting for these on camera, I expect. Uh, what I will probably do between live streams, which will be weekly initially, every Monday morning, uh, just as this one is. Uh, between sessions, I will probably get all of the models kind of up to the to the roughly same stage uh, as uh, as they are at the end of the the live stream. So if I've only worked on one or two models, I'll get the other models up to the same rough state of completion, just so that we're not spending too much time watching me do the same thing over again, and we can kind of talk about the stages as we go. A lot of very hard re to reach areas on these models. 
quite a lot of areas that are pretty chunky for Games Workshop's more recent sculpts. little mindful here, I really don't want to get into the world of wet blending just yet. So wet blending is something that I will be doing on these models almost certainly, um, but I want that, that base coat down before I start that because I don't want to start wet blending into patchiness, um, if I can help it. Switch to a slightly finer brush tip now so that I can get in and do the details. I'm looking at pretty vibrant armor right now. Uh, that is going to get knocked down a bit as we build up those shadows, uh, but it's still going to be very red. I'm going to have to give some thought on how I'm going to knock that back a little bit, because it's, yeah, it's going to be a little bit excessive, I think, if we're not careful. And as I said, I don't really want these to appear like corn so much as chaos undivided so we do need to bring in those those black elements i may end up picking out some armor panels in black just to offset this red armor some no that is cloak after all okay When you're uh, painting up patchy areas like this, if you can see those strokes going down from my initial pass, uh, on the next coverage, as far as possible, try going across that to really smooth out so that you're not always stroke applying brush strokes in the same direction and, and reinforcing what you've done on the first pass. Okay, so we're gonna... Get this kind of khaki color down on the cloak. Yeah, so one of the things that I think we're going to struggle with with this is I really like a little bit more differentiation of color between this uh, khaki that I'm laying down now and the uh, dragon hide up here. So I'm probably going to have to put some thought into how to separate those two aesthetically, keep them distinct while still working within this limited palette. And, and this is this is the challenge of, of working with a limited palette is reflecting what you're seeing or what you're wanting uh, on the model. Uh, and obviously in the case of us miniature painters it's much more kind of matching that vision that we have or you know working to something that is aesthetically pleasing rather than necessarily realistic and so we go Apologies for 
knocking into the camera occasionally. I'm still trying to figure out preferred camera placement to make this work for me. Just gonna go in with some straight black on some of this more recessed area. Establishing some shadows in there. Excited of this helmet. There's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason in the way that I'm applying these. I'm generally trying to work from more recessed areas to more surface areas, but I'm also trying to avoid having to bounce the colors back and forth, trying to avoid unintended wet blending, such as there, where I've managed to really nail that wet blending. I'll have to paint over it. Uh, yeah, I just want to you know, lay down some colors into the model, try and not give a sense that there's any you know, white showing through in areas where it shouldn't, which is quite difficult having already fully assembled these models. If in doubt, just like throwing some black in there. things relatively tidy as we go. Really, at this point, uh, you can't see my wet palette, but I'm, I'm trying to blend something to give my dragon scales a bit of a highlight color. Really help pull them away from the fabric that we're seeing below. I'm also going to use texture, uh, the way that I apply paint to, to help define that. So I'm going to keep these dragon scales kind of stippled. I'll, I'll apply some some coarse texture highlights to the 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 cloth down here. A lot of very, very similar colors appearing on my wet palette, which is going to be a challenge. Very quickly moving into a very muddy realm here of 
many colours that are looking almost identical. always turn your model around so that you've got the easiest access for you for the angle that you need Again, we want to make sure that we've not got any unintended white spots showing through where we've painted or maybe not quite gotten the paint coverage we're wanting. With xenothyl shading you can often get away with little bits right in the back and in the recesses that are not fully painted but still as far as possible want to minimize it. We want to control what, what paint we're seeing where. Set that one aside for a little while. Not done, definitely not done, uh, but much of the core area I think has been covered. I'm going to try and get myself a strong brown out of this using the wet palette. So uh, we're going to go with. Black and red. I'll introduce some ochre. Okay, interesting effect of this is that the ochre is a lot less of a strong colour than the black and the red, so there we go, so this will allow us to paint up some brown belts. say these paints taste vile. You should not eat your paints people. Do not point your brush with your tongue. Find another way.
Okay. We are going to crack out a little bit more of that yellow ochre because I've burnt through it pretty fast. color Much the same as we have before with the other two models, just getting those colours down initially and then we'll start bringing in the blends as we advance a little bit more. I'm going to use this ready brown texture here, thin it so that it flows pretty nicely, there we go. One of the nice things about painting here is, you know, you don't have to worry about your blends being perfectly smooth and consistent across the whole surface. Hair naturally has some variance in its colouring. and You can kind of take advantage of that if you want to be lazy and kind of shift your, your colour mixture a little bit here and there as you go. Especially if, like me, you're running out of the paint that you first mixed and you just want to try and stretch it to the full painting of the model. Which is absolutely what I'm doing right here. Definitely some areas of this that would have been easier to paint in subassembly. Again, this is another area where we're going to have difficulty distinguishing colors a little bit. Uh, we've got the, the browns which are very close to the deep reds here. So we're going to just cheat a bit and use black to provide a bit of separation. probably jump fairly quickly to some stronger reds than I would normally use. A lot of colour is going to be relative to what's around it so you do need to consider that as you're applying your paint. You may end up jumping to a stronger colour faster than you would otherwise. I think we'll be using some metal, non-metallic metal in there as well to, to help with that distinction. And 
all of this I'm actually desaturating the pyrrole red uh, quite a bit actually to make sure that I've still got a, a top red highlight to go to when I need it. So you do want to reserve that color saturation for the very topmost notes. I see a goldfinch. Hello, how's it going? Uh, this is uh, me messing around with the, the Zorn palette, as you know. Um, I'm uh, just, you know, having some fun getting back into the live streaming malarkey. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Lisa or Goldfinch Minis on Instagram is incredibly talented. Uh, I am very jealous of, of her. Uh, painting skills and and frankly her ability to actually put time and consideration into her models, which is something I can never do I, I want my models done <laughs> Done is my favorite color definitely um, but Lisa does uh, Stuff to a very very high level and uh, came away with uh, some medals at uh, Salute this year which uh, was well earned, uh, very impressive work. These guys really like their shields, don't they? Absolutely no idea how I'm going to paint all of the area behind the shield. I think we're just going to block it out for the most part with blocks. <coughs> Switch to a slightly less nice brush. So although I'm, I'm almost using a pure black, I am mixing in some red into it for these areas so that it still kind of marries up with the color you expect it to be for all of the armor plates, etc. And the more accessible areas, like the ones I'm currently painting, it may well brighten up as we go. some color on there in the first place so that it all matches with expectations a little bit. That way Come in with a brighter red, it won't look too out of place. So here we go with a, a quick little bit of wet blending. 
just uh, setting some of those values. Still pretty messy. Messy's fine. Messy's fine. Most of the colours I've used so far I've been mixing with black. We're going to at some point uh, start experimenting a little bit further with uh, just using the uh, the ochre and the, uh, and the red in combination, the ochre and the pearl red, uh, to get a slightly different <coughs> set of colours that are less uh, desaturated um, so. but for the moment we do want kind of a desaturated palette here some color coverage as well on the cloaks. As I said the, the yellow ochre is not nearly as strong as the other two colors and that's reflected in its coverage when applied to the model as well as you may have noticed. was not the colour I was <coughs> wanting in that position. That's better. Just starting to establish a few shadows on the model. as well. It's all very quick and sketchy. We'll refine it as we go. coat down on all the fiddly bits that are kind of glossed over on the first pass.
make sure we catch all of the armor plates this time. We missed quite a few on the first go around. Uh, also get the, the greaves, etc. and tidy up with the ochre Starting to get reasonable coverage on, on the model. I'm just going to quickly get a little bit of um, colour going on the base to match what I'm hoping to do with that because uh, I think that will provide a lot of context for the rest of the model so just mixing up a, a fairly simple grey from the black and the white thinning it pretty heavily and just kind of Pretty much just washing it on. I'm not too concerned about precise application with this. I, I like to be pretty loose and imprecise with my bases, and you'll see that I often kind of mix other elements in as we go. So I'm working quite quickly. It's a very organic process. So we've got. Still a lot of water on the base, and we're just going to jump in with some of the reds, introduce those. I was really hoping I had some more of the, the brown that I'd mixed on the palette, but that's better. Just on these lower areas where there is, might be actual earth underneath all of the rock and rubble. Just introduce that. There's a couple of skulls there that will need detailing at some point. And we'll do the same with the other bases. <laughs> Positional element to it. Keeping it nice and thin and high flow. Covering the whole base. Now this is going to be quite patchy but that actually kind of works for, for stonework. Um, what you'll find is that the the exposed edges are going to tend to remain the, the brighter sections anyway. So it's it's kind of giving you your highlights through through laziness really. It's come out a little bit stronger than I intended. I 
again, just to, like the base will provide context for the model itself, the uh, rim of the base will provide context for the base. So there are areas where I'm actually kind of slopping onto the edges of the base and it makes it look untidy, but we know that that's not going to be there in the end because we're going to tidy that up with a nice black rim. So leave that and then I think this third base is probably going to be the most complicated because there's not much broken earth on it <clears throat> and there's quite a lot of patterning. we go. Some bright on the front half, we're going to darken that down for the back half. Because this is wet on wet, it's uh, very, very easy to, to blend those transitions and, and smooth them out so that you're not entirely sure where the shadows start and end. <coughs> so again, we've not got a a lot of broken ground on this piece, but we can add what we can into those few bits that we do have. Tease it out and let it develop. Yeah. So at the moment we've got a lot of very kind of sloppy, imprecise paint application. And that's fine for the moment. We're going to tune that in, dial it in as we go. So, muddied up this wet palette pretty considerably at this point with water and mixing. All right, so a little over an hour in, we are uh, <coughs> kind of this point in the process. Not quite finished the base coats, uh, but we've done a little bit of, of wet blending in some parts. We've got most of the the models at least covered and the metals we've, we've kind of left exposed I'll probably get to the metals at the very end um, so this is gonna be you know have everything else almost almost finished before we get to those um, that's gonna be I suspect a live stream of its own non-metallic metal is not the fastest process um, but uh, we do have quite a lot of progress. It's looking very sloppy at the moment, but that is expected and intentional. Um, 
what I'm going to do is uh, before uh, next Monday, I'm going to go in, I'm going to tidy up these bits. I'm going to get some pure black going. I'll probably block out the metallic areas um, and uh, just, you know, reinforce the, the, the reds, kind of tidy them up so that <clears throat> there's full coverage uh, ready for us to move on to kind of more shading and highlighting of elements, uh, that kind of thing. So that is where we're at at the moment. All right, folks, well, thank you for joining me on uh, this first live stream. I will uh, be putting this up on on my YouTube channel. So if you were late to the party, uh, or you know, if you missed it, uh, we can uh, you can still see everything that's on there. I'm also going to be reposting over time some of my old um, paint uh, painting videos uh, onto the channel, uh, including a uh, Gargant painting tutorial series and a introduction to painting. Uh, that I that I did a few years ago that kind of guides you through using very very basic paints very basic brushes to paint model to completion so that should uh, get you pretty much where you need to be uh, with your your modeling uh, so you know keep an eye on that please please do subscribe uh, and click the notification bell all of those things are going to help me to really make sure that I'm generating content that people like. The only feedback that I get is from you guys. Uh, you know, I, I do this because I enjoy it, but I really want to make sure that it is helpful for people. Uh, and if you like things, if you subscribe, if you write comments, if you provide feedback, those are the ways that I can make sure that this is really tailored for, for what you guys need. So the more feedback I get, the better. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all for joining, and I will see you again next Monday. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, folks.